All right. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Whitney Carr. I'm the Adult Services Manager here at the library. Um, happy Bexley Day. <laughs> um, so, um, so this is the first time we've done a program recognizing uh, Bexley Day. And so I really want to thank, you know, David for his hard work putting this presentation together, for the Bexley Historical Society, for, um, for getting the refreshments and for partnering with us on this program. Please check out their display That's at the please end. Welcome. Again, our local history librarian, David Disselhorst. Thanks. Thank you. Tonight's program, Mapping Bexley from Wilderness to Village, will use a series of maps to show how Bexley emerged from the 18th century, 1800s wilderness, um, and even some elements of Bexley streets, um, boundaries, um, have their roots even deeper into the past. Like Whitney said, we're partnering tonight with the Bexley Historical Society to celebrate the 114th birthday of Bexley. And on our Twitter feed at the library, we um, announcing this program, we received well wishes, happy Bexley day from the London borough of Bexley in England. Our first map is dated 1755. It was drawn by John Mitchell. This is the map that in 1783 was used at the peace treaty signing in Paris that ended the Revolutionary War. The British wanted the um, Ohio River to be the westernmost boundary of the new United States and um, representatives from of the colonies were adamant they would go back and fight until they could have all the lands east of the Mississippi and northwest of the Ohio River. This not only uh, doubled the size of the new nation, but it was the first time the United States government actually owned land. If we zoom in to the area south of Lake Erie, we can see Salt Lick Creek. This is um, a translation of the Delaware term sekel, sepong, meaning uh, Salt Lick Creek. Um, it's for the salty taste of the water. And that is what we know as Alum Creek, the Western boundary line of Bexley. And this is the first time that Alum Creek shows up on a map. What? Yes. That was drawn by John Mitchell. How much is the from um, That's a good question. They were here first. So the um, next map um, shows the state of Ohio, um, which became a state as we all know in 1803. This, this shows the glacial boundary. So during the last ice age, some thousands of years ago, um, most of Ohio is relatively flat from the ice that melted and um, in turn left our water, carved out the water courses like the Scioto River and Alum Creek. Um, it was followed by dense forests um, the, and, the, and, we, and it carved out the gradual slopes we have. So like with the east bank of Alum Creek being slightly higher than the west bank. This map is circa 1892. And if we look over here on the east side of Columbus, Alum Creek, this is designating the location of a, a mound. This is the uh, McCullough Mound on the farm of George McCullough in, in the area of what is now Wolf, Wolf Park. Um, relics were found of the Adena period and taken from the mound by the McCullough family. Those eventually were given to the Ohio Historical Society. Today is Ohio Historical Connection who, who owns those, um, those pieces. It's evidence of um, early indigenous people who um, built mounds for ceremonial and burial purposes. In 1803, Franklin County uh, stretched all the way north to Lake Erie. It's um, 
boundaries were not fixed until 1851 and named for Benjamin Franklin. Thinking back to what I said earlier about how the United States government owned lands, they broke up parts of Ohio for different purposes. And Bexley falls within the refugee tract, which its westernmost boundary is the is Scioto River. It goes east through four counties. And uh, its northern boundary in Franklin County is Fifth Avenue, its southern boundary, Refugee Road. This land was set aside by the government to um, make good to refugees who lost their lands or property in, in Canada for supporting the colonies. Um, they, they fled to the they fled to the colonies and supported these, these would have been individuals who supported the colonies throughout the war. In 1799, uh, what we're looking here is Township 5. Township 5 was platted and would become Montgomery Township. This is the westernmost township in the refugee tract, and it was surveyed into sections of 640 acres each. When the government uh, decided to grant, make land grants to those refugees in 1801, they determined that 640 acres was too large for um, many of the grants. So it was re the, um, all of the refugee tract was subdivided into half sections and renumbered. And each has 320 acres. So in 1802, the government makes its land grants to those refugees. And what you're looking at now is the territory that is today Bexley. So Bexley has four entire half sections, 17, 18, 19, and 20, and parts of four other half sections, section one, 16, two, and 21. Most of this territory, section 17, 19, and 20, in an inverted L shape, was granted to Francis Cazou. He was a Frenchman who was a fur merchant living in Montreal at the outbreak of the revolution. He, was sympath he showed sympathy for the colonies by circulating pamphlets for the First Continental Congress. He supplied troops, provided shelter for rebel officers, escaped prison. However, when he received his land grant, he was already back in his native France. And like many of the recipients of the grants, most did not settle on the land in Ohio. They were older by 1802, settled in parts of the Eastern United States and needed money more than they needed land. So they sold their land grants, and mo much was bought by uh, land um, by investors. The next map of the area is in 1842. At this time, there are 15 landowners. You'll notice that things are that the the land parcels are still within those half section divisions. Divide, most of them being divided in half and purchased by different people. So here's section one, you've got two owners here, similar divisions here. The first road through the area um, in 1823 was the Columbus Granville Road. It was the only east, um, Eastern way to and from Columbus at the time. And that's now Broad Street. In a, a decade later, in 1833, the National Road comes through, and that is Main Street. So we now have the 
roads that create the boundaries for our North, Central, and South Bexley. In addition, um, you can see the first uh, land owner in Bexley to settle on the land, and that is David Nelson. Although his home is on the West Bank and he operates a mill on the West Bank, his land does go to the east of Alum Creek, and this it would be the area of Jeffrey Park. And another boundary that we can see is the township line. This is the easternmost township line of uh, Montgomery Township, which becomes the eastern boundary for Bexley, and that is Gould Road. Which road? Gould Road. Our next map in 1856, we can see that in little over a decade, the number of landowners has more than doubled to 30. In addition, in 1853, the Central Ohio Railroad comes through half section number one, giving us the northern boundary of Bexley. By that time, Livingston Avenue is nothing more than a trail. Um, Edward Livingston, who settles on, on the West Bank here, builds a trail, um, forged a trail west to the Seattle River, and that is the trail is nearly the same as today's Livingston Avenue. We can see not only, well, if we look at 1842, we can see there's a trail here indicated. And this is in a straight line. And then when we get to 1856, it's slightly bends here to the north. It's not until 1876, two decades after this map is drawn that the Pleasant Ridge Turnpike is officially um, made by the county commissioners and allowed to be improved, but it had been a trail prior. And that was a trail following the road 33 here that goes south, which was an old Indian trail from Lancaster. So as the people moved into the area, the first road they extended into the area that wasn't a through street was the Pleasant Ridge Turnpike. And that is today's College Avenue. At its northern terminus, we can see activity, um, lots of structures. You also have many more homes. So by 1856, this area is pretty well populated with farmers. And by 1872, the number of landowners hasn't increased by that much. The real growth begins in 1876 with Capital University. So you'll notice on this map that Capital University is on Main Street at Gould Road on the map. The initial um, offers that they received from many cities around Ohio to get Capital University to move was from a man named uh, Frederick Michael, and he offered 50 acres on his farm. He later sold the rest of the farm to Joseph Ryder. The university accepted it. However, they located west closer to Alum Creek where they are now on 10 acres of land. And that land was purchased by William F. Lehman, the president of the university. They hold on to this property for some time and eventually selling it as an investment. In 1892, we can start seeing the area fill out with streets and additions. South here, south of Main Street in the university area, we are seeing more streets. And then the large addition of Bullet Park. So Bullet Park is um, platted by um, a, man, a man named um, Logan Bullet, 
who's a, an investor. He, he's not from the area. I believe he's from Philadelphia. And it's, it's slow to develop until 1898 when Camp Bushnell uses the property, the state uses the property for a Spanish American war encampment. This encampment brings some 7,000 soldiers to the area over less than a month period to, um, to gather, to be enlisted, and then to ship south to training camps for the Spanish American War. The advantage to the area is the utilities that are extended east of Alum Creek from the city, and that aids in further development and, and, and Bullet Park actually beginning to sell lots for houses. We can fast forward a bit. We all know the story of how Bexley came into being, the community around the Pleasant Ridge Turnpike, which is where the Pleasant Ridge community gets its name, around Capital University, and the homeowners up in the Bullet Park area, notably the Kilborns and the Jeffreys, joined together to incorporate a village. The initial 1908 village lines are up here just north of Maryland, east of Cassidy, down to Livingston and along the creek. And this area here, Wolf Park, is a part of Bexley for not even 12 months. So there's different theories as to this. There's one story that's often told about how uh, the owner of the land wanted to be mayor of Columbus. So he had the property in incorporated into Columbus. This, this theory or this uh, is not something I've been able to back up too well with facts. In the end, in 1908, there's only about two or three residents in this area. Actually none here, but there's some people living right here. And so in order for um, this to be annexed to Columbus, they need these voters here. And so this section here is included in it. And with those two or three voters, they're able to get the city of Columbus to annex it. And the more likely story is that a property owner by the name of Wolf wanted to include it as a park in Columbus. This portion here that they needed the voters from to annex was eventually returned to Bexley. So the line is straight down Westland. Today, Bexley is made up of some 50 plus additions, Bullet Park still being one of the larger. We can still see evidence of the uh, refugee tract boundary lines. The southern line of half section two is Maryland Avenue. The line dividing the half sections from west and east is Cassidy, Gould Road on the east, Livingston Avenue, and Fair Avenue. And if you can imagine Westland Avenue as a straight line, you'll have the western boundary of the two half sections. So those elements remain pretty much for all time. Only in one case does a property straddle the line. So as these additions are, as, these, as farms are turned into residential additions or land investors are buying multiple farms and turning them to an, into an addition, someone acquires land on both sides in two different half sections, whereas most of the, well, and again here, most of these remain within, influenced by the divisions all the way back to 1803 as land is bought and sold. And this map, you might be wondering why some are colored and some aren't. We are collecting um, abstracts of title, which are records that show the history of land back, to 1803 to the refugee track land grants. And the ones that are colored in are ones we have represented in our collection with the uh, abstract of title. The ones that aren't colored are areas we are still looking for an abstract. So if you have one of these legal size documents that's hundreds of pages showing the history of the transactions all the way up until usually into the 60s, 70s and 80s, we'd like to borrow it to scan.
And if you'd like to go into our digital collections at bexleylibrary.org, you can review these documents that help trace the history of land transfers from the refugee grant, refugee track grant being made by the president and then each subsequent sale as the land is divided up and then eventually becomes housing lots. And tonight, after, to continue our presentation with uh, our partners at the Bexley Historical Society, we'd like to invite you to um, mingle. And we have the trustees here tonight. They're wearing their Bexley Historical Society t-shirts and they'd be happy to share what they're working on and what, what they're doing. And um, please find time to visit the museum on Clifton Avenue. It's in the caretaker's house, the Jeffrey Ma Mansion caretaker's house open the first Thursdays of the month. Open it for questions. Yes. Yeah. And that, that also led to all of the park grant around Griggs Reservoir in that area. And then he also caused to be purchased the land uh, of Wolf Park, obviously named it after himself and saved the slither uh, that he developed lots on. Uh, but because he was representing Columbus in that effort, he could not legitimately, in his mind, keep the land in Bexley. So it became, and that, and then uh, the Nelson Park and all of that became really the East Side's contribution to the uh, to the parks movement and the, the City Beautiful movement. So just a little a little background on that, and a couple other quick things. But the um, Bullock Park probably went under twice. <laughs> it started in the 1890s, but the uh, they had two about 250 acres, a half million dollars in money. And it was the Drexel Investment Company out of uh, Philadelphia. Uh, had a local guy involved too, but the, uh, they went through two recessions, 1893, 1897, uh, but they had all that upfront cost. They had the land cost, they had the brick curbings, they had the sewer, they had the water, uh, but they didn't sell very much till uh, basically after the 1900s, the 1905, 1910, when it really started to take off a little bit. So, uh, um, they got a little underwater and yeah. they they were saved by the Drexel investment firm later in terms of reinvesting uh, to make sure the whole property is good. And then the last little fact for just the, um, when they did the design, the design for Bullock Park reinstituted the carriage lanes that used to be downtown. You'd have a carriage lane, a median, two travel lanes, another median, the other carriage lane. And that ran to Cassidy uh, one of the knocks for the, the Bullet Park uh, was that they, they didn't have a place for their telephone poles. So they had these beautiful houses, but the telephone poles just jumped up and down as, as they still do today, but covered by trees. And Arlington on the other side of town, of course, buried their lines. And that became an issue. So from Cassidy eastward, the uh, alleys were instituted and alleys then became the way to take care of the telephone poles and the trash, didn't need the carriage lanes anymore. So it was a real transformation when you look at uh, East versus West mm -hmm. in terms of how that was handled. So just a couple of little things to throw out there. So to your note on Bullet Park, if you look at the early Bullet Park um, maps, and it, you can see some of it here, Bullet Park initially was a lot larger than Bullet Park actually is today. So right here is Drexel. You can see this street at an angle, doesn't exist. This entire plat was eventually redrawn when it was made an addition to Bexley. Um, Bullet Park doesn't stretch that far today. Um, this being Mound Street, Brighton Road. Um, when you look at today's map, Brighton Road, Bullet Park's up here at Dale. So Bullet Park came further south, further south here and even east in the initial plans. Now, and like you said, some of those, they were on paper only. Yeah, the, the, it was interesting because what you had was not only the political melding 
of the um, of in effect the, the village of Pleasant Ridge, kind of an association, and then the Bullet Park folks up north. But the same was true even with roads, because coming from the north down was Parkview, Columbia, and Drexel. Coming from the south up uh, was, I think, Wells, Lehman, and Magnolia, and the uh, same streets. And so they had to meet in the middle. They couldn't be both names. So uh, the the bigger names won, and that's how that came out. So. <laughs> Yes. Why is Cassidy Avenue called that? Why not Gould Avenue? Uh -huh. So Cassidy, um, <laughs> the actual Cassidy loan, landowner is um, going to be north of Bexley. He had a farm up here, the owned land up there. here. And at Cassidy, it does stretch further north to Fifth yeah. Avenue. So the, the property it's named after was outside of Bexley. Yeah. Do you have any idea what his farm? Yeah, now Cassidy had uh, a big farm, and he also, Thomas Dominic Cassidy, 1842 to 1902. He gave the land for the church, and then he also then subsequently gave the land for uh, the school. Which, and he which, then which decided church? that uh, farming, when, when the when the Ralston, it was started off as Rarick uh, 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 Company doing boilers and stuff, but then it became the Ralston Rail Car Company. And so he elected then to provide company housing for that enterprise and went into the real estate business. So he dropped farming like a hot rock mm -hmm. and, and away he went uh, with that. And there was no one else to really name the, the, the road after. So it was Cassidy's Road. I mean, that's just what it was called. How about Gould? Don't know. I, that by the time Gould came about, Gould, Gould was initially much later in time. Uh, yeah. And Gould was probably, I'm going to guess, somebody that had to do this with development because that was a, a much later in time street. Yeah, so Gould Road was initially Township Line Road, given its designation as the township border between Montgomery and Turo. Well, the first time I ever saw Cassidy, the thing that brings me to my mind, Cassidy and the Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't name it after the guy. Might as well mess it. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Oh, can we? Do you? Okay. I, there's someone up here, Whitney. I I now live in Northeast Moore, and someone, an older resident, told me that at one time, Bexley had intended to go from the east side of Gould all the way to James Road subdivision by subdivision, but that never happened. Did you run across anything like that? Because the subdivisions there are like one side of a street and then the houses behind them. So they're like one street wide all the way up from there to James Road. Uh, I haven't read anything about that, but Montgomery Township is taken over by the city of Columbus. And by 1900, the city of Columbus is basically on the west bank of Alum Creek um, and, and, continue, and continuing to grow. So what happens is Montgomery Township later in the 1800s is ch changed to Marion Township. And it, if you think of Columbus over here, think of Marion Township as a inverted letter C, mostly to the east, but a little to the north and a little to the south. So when Bexley becomes a when Bexley becomes a village, they're going to the Marion Township trustees and saying, "Look, we want to be a village." Well, if you're going to the Marion Township trustees, you can't go any further east than Gold Road Township Line Road. So Bexley is also a lot like um, Bullet Park, slow to develop. In the 1920s, you start having a real housing boom in Bexley, but it's really not until after World War II that Bexley's starting to fill out to the east. After World War II, you have Eastmore really starting to fill out. Um, not gonna say that someone ambitious <laughs> wanted Bexley to go east, but I've not read anything to that effect. And Certainly, they would have come up against Columbus. When Bexley initially becomes a township in 1908, they are taken to court 
basically they go all the way to the Ohio Supreme Court to become a village because Columbus is claiming that they've already annexed this area that Bexley wants as a village. So it, I mean, I wouldn't mind looking into it, see if there's anything there, but I'm not aware of anything. Yes. The whole, east side of, the whole east side of Bexley was pretty vacant uh, up until the 40s and then onward. Because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's why the housing transition is so different, the ranches and so forth, because the Depression really stalled things out. Uh, and by that time, Columbus had annexed this ground. And also because Bexley did not have its own sewer plant, it had to contract with the city of Columbus. And they had to then agree to what the boundaries of Bexley was going to be and what they were not going to be. Uh, so I think part of that ended up being a contractual uh, understanding. No, this is your service area that we Columbus will serve, and therefore that's as big as you're going to get. Well, I can't help but notice that when you're founded in 1908, that's the coal age. And I'm originally from Logan, and Logan used to ship oh, so many carloads of coal to, to the Columbus area. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. But in the Logan history, they talk a lot about coal dealers on the southeast side of Columbus. And they don't give an address or the name. I don't remember the name of anybody. Was there ever a guy who had a pile of coal in Bexley and sold it to people? Um, Bexley has never had any sort of industry within its boundaries. It's always been intended. I think, hey, Whitney, don't miss, there's someone in with the yellow shirt in the back there that had his question. But you're, you know, you're right. The, the, tr the trains brought the coal north to Columbus and that was a south side industry. Yeah, with the risk of talking too much. Uh, the, the Wolf Park ground was actually at one point owned by Columbus Coal and Lime. And that company still exists, uh, uh, what the Nieder, uh, Niedermeyer uh, family. Um, and uh, I don't know what the transaction occurred that then, you know, Wolf owned it. Uh, but, and and why it was called, you know, it was just owned by that company. I had no idea what they were going to do with it. Be an interesting question for somebody. Thanks. <laughs> And they got, they sold lime, they were German, and the people who were in the German villages, and they were the one in Franklin, used to buy lime in the country. So I think the lime is going to be Yeah, I just wanted to ask you mentioned that Frank, Franklin County is named after Ben Franklin. Was there a reason? to name after him or was it just a general other, other than a lot of locations are being named for him just because he's such a, a significant figure in, in in the early times of the, the, the country um, <laughs> um there there's there's a better story behind <laughs> um we would have had him join us tonight but <laughs> Alas, I can't have everything. Um, the, there's a better story behind how Montgomery Township gets its name. So talking about the refugee track, going back to the Revolutionary War, there's a General Montgomery. General Montgomery is related to the Livingston family. Um, he, is, he dies on the last day of the year in Canada, and it's the end of the colonies invasion of Canada. The idea of Canada being the 14th colony, that's an, it is over with. Um, the Livingston, who, who is a refugee, he is granted the land south of what is now Bexley. And he doesn't settle there, but the, this is one of those cases as the closest possible connection to the actual land grant. He gives it to his son. So his son does settle on the land. His son becomes a judge. And so he names it for his relative, General Montgomery, who was killed in Canada during the invasion of Canada. Yeah. An interesting perspective 
uh, going back to the start, and these maps are fabulous, um, that the conversions, the two factors really were very interesting at the, at the start. One was that the process of surveying got a lot more accurate through the early 1700s and onward. And number two, that there was this vast piece of land that, quote, nobody owned that could be divided up for sale. And that was an unheard of concept because Europe, the land was all owned by the nobility. Nobody, nobody owned land. The, the thought of getting your own piece of ground uh, was an impossibility if you're from Europe anywhere. So here, because of, of both the quality of surveying and this vast tract of land, this was this was like heaven. I could own my own piece of ground and I could do my own thing on my own piece of ground. It, it, unique really in the uh, in the world in terms of history to this point in time. I'm kind of an amateur historian, and I've tried to keep track of the sizes of cities. And somebody might want to double check me, but I believe I've read that in the 1900 U.S. Census, Cleveland had 700,000, Cincinnati 500,000, and Columbus had 125,000. And I think I'm going to throw in that Los Angeles had 100,000. So there's a bit of a living. there's a bit of a trend happening. I said that. Bexley was slow to develop. What was before Bexley, you know, what is now Bexley was slow to develop, not taking hold to really the 1850s. Well, Columbus was also very slow to grow. It took them from 1812 to the 1900s to reach Alum Creek. And then we're looking at the end of World War II for them to start branching further east. So Columbus is also very slow in growth. They so there, there was a combination um corn um there, they also had cattle there was actually on the capital university property a slaughterhouse um so it, it was a range um the, the one more observation about your thing with cleveland and the population and and our growth um, Maynard Sensenbrenner, when he was mayor of Columbus, um, at that time, all the little outward communities, the Dublins, the Westervilles, and Gehannas, and where they were small places. And so he contracted with all of those places, just like Bexley, to what their service areas would be to serve uh, centrally from Columbus, their sewer and water. But what he made sure is that none of those communities would touch each other. So there'd be corridors through those communities so Columbus would not be landlocked. And so Polaris and going up into Delaware and doing all that. Uh, so Columbus had the advantage over Cleveland, which early in its history got landlocked and couldn't grow as a city anymore. All the suburbs around it grew, but not the city itself. Oh, streets like Merkel, um, Ardmore. Oh, Can anyone speak to the origins of, of street names um, such as Merkel or Ardmore? Are, are those, um, those landowners or developers? The, yeah, Merkel's, uh, Merkel was a developer. Uh, the, the, and all of Bexley was a real estate developer. Every inch of it was a real estate development. Uh, and it became, uh, it, it, and, and after Bullet Park kind of set the tone, uh, but it, Bullet Park kind of, in effect, exhausted the market for large homes. So then after, the, and, and back then, what you did was you bought a lot, you hired an architect, you built your house. But as we approached the smaller lots, or we approached and we, a change was made, then they went to smaller lots and you had the builder developer. And the builder developer then, uh, would buy lots, some, sometimes build the houses on them. There were uh, quite a few companies that did that, Hansberger, Mary and Barry and a bunch. Uh, but then they got to name their own streets. And so uh, at that time, uh, you were required to do street trees, as you are now. Uh, and so Ardmore was just a wonderful name to have for a street, Ardmore. Uh, but there were uh, other streets that were, of course, named for, for developers. 
yeah, so some of the streets are also former landowners. And what's interesting in South Bexley, on some of the early plat maps, when they're creating the different additions, is there's a lot of German names for streets that don't exist anymore. So it might have been um, people affiliated with the university or other area landowners. And then as Bexley comes in, they change those names. Uh, the name of Bexley go, is attributed to the Kilbournes, um, who right here you have um, Jeffrey Park, Long Park View, the Jeffrey home, the Kilbournes had a home up here. They were some of those early builders in 1905, 1906 that came in that joined with the Pleasant Ridge community, and he selected it for his um, native home, his ancestor's home of Bexley, which is a parish in England of London. Well, I happen to have the microphone. Can I ask? Sure. See, how do, you um, do any of the early maps show geographical features such as wet spots? I know we all have a few <laughs> wet spots now. Uh, I, have, I, I don't believe I have it here. Obviously, in, in this map, the only geographic feature you have is the Lum Creek. I have seen a map um, that shows a watercourse somewhere in the Bexley area that's now that's now buried. Um, Bliss Creek. <laughs> Did it connect to a lot? <laughs> So, <laughs> of course, Bexley is relatively flat. It it sits on a ridge that's slightly higher than the west um, bank of the Lump Creek and Pleasant Ridge. It, the ridge would have been more noticeable in the 1800s. It's since been in different places flattened out. If you look, if you look behind. Um, Go back to a more modern map. Um, Jeffrey Park. So this is Westland. And if you Im draw an imaginary line, that is the western line of the half section. And so Bullet Park stays within the half section. The Jeffrey Mansion is here. And then you have that drop behind the mansion to the flatter part, the park. And then it continues to gradually drop. That drop behind the mansion would have been more gradual. It was cut more severe for the um, the stairs and the and the back patio, but you would have seen a gradual decline to the. Um, and so one reason why you have David Nelson, the early settlers in the early 1800s, David Nelson over here. Livingston over here on the west side, west side of the creek, is this is this is all forest, very dense forest. The the creek, the water flow has placed um, rich soil on the bottomlands to the west, and so it's good land to farm. When, when did it start? They built they built their home in. 18, 1904, 1905. But the Jeffrey family dates back much earlier. This is the, the home here is Robert H. Jeffrey. He's mayor of Columbus prior to building the home and, and being part of the founding of Bexley. His father is the founder of Jeffrey Manufacturing. So the family dates at least 50 years back before that, if not more. And the Kilborns go back to the early years of the state. Related, were they to the town of Kilborn Direct line. Mm -hmm. Another little just crazy factoid. Um, so Parkview, um, Parkview North, Parkview South. Well, Parkview uh, originally was two words. And if you lived north on Parkview, you kind of guaranteed that you had a park view uh, <laughs> because big pieces of ground going down to the creek. On South Parkview, well, you had a park view for a while, 
looking down until uh, uh, the, the actual park was put in and a couple of streets were put down there that took away your park view. Uh, so Larry, I live down here on Park Avenue and I have a view of a park. So does that mean I get to feel like I live in Park View? I have an exclusive apartment on Park View. There's really not a street. It's just a parking lot, but Park Drive's my address. Can't find a Park Drive street sign anywhere for life to me. But it would have been the extension if you were to imagine Parkview continuing south. Um, but Capital University owns most of this now. There's those street names do extend north of railroad tracks. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, a lot of them do continue. And some of the names, some of the, we were talking about early names, um, Bryden, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, Bryden Road extends west into Mound Street continues straight through, even west of Scioto. So a lot of the names were adapted from the west across the creek. Yes, the, the, the mound would have been right in the middle of Mound Street downtown. Uh, our, the, our historical society because uh, we're going to be adding a lot of things onto the web page about some neat articles and some fun. Uh, there's lots of really interesting history, um, behind the scenes stories, forgotten open spaces, all kinds of things that are really neat. Um, and the, the more people understand how we got to what we have and how we keep what we have, uh, and and be part of a continuing history of its stewardship, then this place is going to be great for a long time. So uh, tune in for more. Yeah, stay tuned. Uh, Bexley Public Library and the Bexley Historical Society are already planning Bexley Day 2023. So it's going to be bigger and cake is guaranteed. So yeah, feel free. Um, the, if the trustees want to stand, you know, feel free to speak with them, learn about the Historical Society, um, 